continuous prayer. If you look at what some of the things Christ said, He says, Father's Day is coming up. He says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. So is it possible to receive the Holy Spirit as they did? Now granted, they received the Holy Spirit initially on Pentecost, but then it says they were filled again. They were constantly filled. Is it possible for us to be constantly filled? Absolutely. It's possible. But how willing are we? I promise you, there's no one here that receives an amazing anointing of the power of the Holy Spirit from on high that regrets any moment of the effort that's put into it. So we have this challenge. We have to find a way to pray continuously from our hearts, full of faith, for the purpose of God. Now, when I did this at St. John a few years ago, I don't know if we're going to do it here yet. I need to talk to Father David because uh, it's going to require some planning. I was like, how do we do continuous prayer? Now, there is the Jesus Prayer. If you ever read the book, The Way of a Pilgrim, it talks about continuous prayer. It's an awesome book, The Way of a Pilgrim. It's a fascinating book. But that was more for an individual. So, and it's kind of going to be like that for us as well, but... We can't be together all the time. But what if we... I looked up this thing called the Unceasing Prayer Initiative. Because I like the internet. I like Google. You can just put Unceasing Prayer. And uh, there's an initiative in Austin, Texas. A bunch of churches got together. 31 churches. Maybe 30. I don't know exactly. They decided that every church is going to pray continuously for 24 hours, one day a month. Every month. So that in the city of Austin, there would be continuous prayer for the mission and purpose of God. I thought, wow, that's pretty awesome. So when we did it at St. John, we started it one day a month, hoping that somehow we would get 30 other churches to jump on board. My brother's going to do this series in his church, so maybe we'll get them on board. I just gave it at a, a St. George's church, maybe in their interest. Maybe we'll get three days. Three days a month for the purpose of God. I don't know. But I don't think we're going to accomplish what we want to accomplish without power from on high. We're saying, well, we have to collect a lot of money. That's nothing for the power from on high. We have to do all this preparation. We have nothing for the power from on high. So we definitely want to begin the initiative of praying together. So when we talk to Father David, we would like to start a prayer meeting or some type of continuous prayer initiative for our church. And just so you know, all the fathers and everyone, you will never grow in your spiritual life without two things. The grace of God the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit. And so we need to pray for those things. So what I wanted to do was, um, I actually wanted to pray at the end. We're going to pray the litanies of the third hour. It'll take us two minutes. But... What I'm doing in this fast, I'm going to pray the third hour of the Igbeya every day. Because I feel it's dedicated towards the Holy Spirit. So I have some Igbeyas here. We're just going to stand and pray the litanies, and then we'll conclude. Mark, you have on your This is the only chance for us to be on the same translation if we all hold the same book. And that's crazy. Okay, um, I'm going to start with the gospel because it's related to the Holy Spirit and then we'll read the witness. Holy, 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 read the gospel according to St. John. May his blessing be upon us all. Amen. When the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, has come, he shall teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I have said unto you. My peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives do I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again to you. If you love me, you would rejoice, because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes to pass, that when it comes to pass you might believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the Prince of this world has come 
comes and he has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. Glory be to God forever. Amen. The litanies together. Your Holy Spirit, O Lord, whom you sent forth upon your holy disciples and honored apostles in the third hour, do not take away from us, O good one, but renew him within us. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. O Lord, who sent down your Holy Spirit upon your holy disciples and your honored apostles in the third hour, do not take him away from us, O good one, but we ask you to renew him within us. O Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, the Word, a right and life-giving spirit, a spirit of prophecy and chastity, a spirit of holiness, righteousness, and authority. O the Almighty One, for you are the light of our souls. O you who gives light to every man that comes into the world, have mercy on us. O Theotokos, you are the true vine who bore the cluster of life. We ask you, O full of grace with the apostles, for the salvation of our souls. Blessed is the Lord our God, blessed is the Lord day by day. He prepares our way, for He is the God of our salvation. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who is present in all places and fills all, the treasury of good things and the life giver, graciously come, O good and purify us from all defilement, O good one, and save our souls. Just as you were with your disciples, O Savior, and give them peace, graciously come also and be with us and grant us your peace and save us and deliver our souls. And then just the, the absolution right next to it on page uh, 51. O God of all compassion, Lord of all comfort, who comforted us at all times with the comfort of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for you raised us for prayer in this hour in which you abundantly pour the grace of your Holy Spirit upon your holy disciples and honorable and blessed apostles like tongues of fire. We ask and entreat you, O lover of mankind, to accept our prayers and forgive our sins and send forth upon us the grace of your Holy Spirit and purify us from all defilement of body and spirit. Change us into a spiritual manner of life that we may walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, and make us worthy to serve you with purity and righteousness all the days of our life. For unto you is due glory, honor, and dominion with your good Father and the Holy Spirit, now and ever unto the ages of all ages. Amen. My dear Lord Jesus Christ, with your good Father and the Holy Spirit, we thank you. We are in awe of your amazing works, of your great love, for your great plan, your purpose for us, that not only us, but every single sinner should be saved from turn from their ways and come to you, dear Lord. None of us would be anything without you, dear Lord. We realize and we heard today that we are merely about five loaves and two fish. We are nothing without you, dear Lord. But we look unto you as our faithful promiser and our faithful Father who desires to give us great things. The most important thing, the Holy Spirit. We beseech you with our whole hearts, dear Lord. We want to live transformed lives. We want to go to a church that is a transformed church that is willing to transform the city and the lives around it. We pray, dear Lord, as you anointed your apostles, that you would anoint us as well. We pray, dear Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit, that we would be overflowing, dear Lord that your word would proceed from your mouth, that you would grant us the mind of your Son, that you would give us open hearts for all people, that you would give us boldness and courage. Give us, O oh Lord, to be compelled by your Spirit, and purposed by your Spirit, and bound in the Spirit, doing your will for the sake of your glory and your kingdom. Bless all of us, those who could not be here, and those who eventually will be here, dear Lord. We ask all this in your precious name, the intercession of St. Mary, all the apostles, and all those who have ever been filled by the Holy Spirit and pleased you, when we say with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Read the book of Acts. Pray the third hour of the Igbeya. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Come bring that into the church. Let's get together in the liturgy with one mind, one accord, one peace, for one purpose, glorifying God. Have a great week. What, what can this power do? Well, this kind of power defeats great empires. This kind of power defeats great immorality. This kind of power will allow you to endure persecution. This kind of power will allow you to change enemies into brothers and sisters in Christ. When you look at the works of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, you have to be astonished. And actually, so were they. I'm going to read some of the things that people said when they saw the things in the book of Acts. In Acts 2 7, it says, They were all amazed and perplexed. In Acts 2 37, they were cut to the heart. In 2 43, fear came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. In 4.14, in seeing the man who had been healed, they could say nothing about it. In 4.16, what shall we do with these men? For indeed a notable miracle has been done through them, and it is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, we cannot deny it. It was incredible what the Holy Spirit did. Now, I'm going to give you a challenge. When you read the book of Acts, which I've just asked you to do, I want you to focus on the word Spirit, Holy Spirit, wherever it says Holy Spirit. So the word Spirit occurs about 71 times in the book of Acts. So granted there are like talks about evil spirits and stuff like that. So it's about like 55 to 60 times where it talks about the Holy Spirit. In 28 chapters, the book of Acts is filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you think they could have done this without the Holy Spirit? I mean if you think about it, the apostles... They had already done miracles before, right? Didn't they cast out demons? Didn't they already heal sick people? They saw Christ. They learned from Him. Why didn't they just go on their own? Because what did Christ say? He says, without me, you can do nothing. They needed the Holy Spirit. And all the things that we're going to try and do in this church, we will not accomplish. Like, we might have great plans and come up with great ideas and, and come up with like a strategy and, and have great talks and you know parties and activities and that will not change the world and that may not even get us a church but what will get us a church is power from on high power from on high and if you look at what happened as a result of the Holy Spirit I'm going to just read some verses from the book of Acts in chapter 431, it says this. They were having a prayer meeting. The apostles got out of prison. It says, And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. Any church that prays like them, I recommend getting earthquake insurance. Because if you are praying like them, your place should shake. It says in Acts 6.10, when Stephen was one of the deacons, do you know how they chose the deacons? What was the qualification of a deacon? They chose seven deacons. One of the qualifications was they had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 6, Stephen is defending Christianity, and he goes through the whole Old Testament to all the Jewish leaders. It says, Stephen spoke, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. In Acts 9.31, Then the churches throughout all of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. All the churches, they were walking in the fear of God, in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, and then they were multiplied. It's amazing. I'm going to read some of the things in... in the Holy Spirit to me is an amazing topic and in Acts it's very, very evident. Before Paul and Barnabas got sent, they were fasting and praying. It says in chapter 13, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So they ministered and fasted. Now I want to ask you, we fast with what intention? Like, it's almost like going to the gym every day and walking inside the gym but not lifting any weights. 
Like you're not getting any benefit of going to the gym. Why are we fasting? What is the benefit of the fast? Do you expect in the fast of the apostles, when we're fasting for the work of the Spirit of God, is that what we're seeking and asking for? Shouldn't that be our full, our focus and our goal? It should, absolutely. And it says in verse 4, So then being sent out by the Holy Spirit. They were sent out. In verse 9, the same chapter, Then Saul, who was called Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then there's a few verse in a few chapters where there's like one verse that talks about the Spirit in the life of St. Paul. St. Paul is the other person who makes me crazy, but that's because of the Holy Spirit's work in him. So listen to these few verses of what the Spirit did in St. Paul. It says in seven, chapter 17, Now Paul waited for them at Athens. His spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was given over to idols. Athens, city that was following philosophy and idolatry, his spirit was provoked by the Spirit of God. In verse 18, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit. So at first, his spirit was provoked. Now he's compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is Christ. In the next chapter, in 1921, when these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit when he had passed through Macedonia to go to Jerusalem. So he was provoked, compelled, purposed, and then in chapter 20, he says one of my favorite things. They're telling him he's going to die when he goes to Jerusalem. But the Spirit testified that whoever built this is, is going to die. And then he says this, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there. He was bound in the Spirit. When was the last time you were bound with the Spirit? You know, it's interesting. They never said, and so-and-so received a small portion, a few drops of the Spirit. It never says they received a half cup. Every time it says, and they were filled with the Spirit. When was the last time that your relationship with God was at the point where you were being filled with the Holy Spirit to the point where you were being bound by the Holy Spirit, provoked by the Holy Spirit, compelled by the Holy Spirit, and purposed in the Holy Spirit. That's where we need to be. We're going to have great strategies and activities and this and that, but what if we had a church where the individuals were filled with the Holy Spirit? Now granted, we are filled with the Holy Spirit when we are in church, participating in the liturgy. Um, participating in the life of the church. But there's more, and we're going to talk about that. So how did they get this amazing, infinite power? What were the things they did that allowed them to receive the Spirit as they did? I'm going to read to you from Acts chapter 1. So I read to you the first part, and this is uh, verses 12 through 14. It says, Then they returned to Jerusalem. After Christ told them to stay in Jerusalem, they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Pay attention to this next verse. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with the holy brethren. They continued with one accord in prayer. That was the secret. It's interesting, Christ says, I want you to go to Jerusalem, and you're going to receive power from on high. He says, I want you to stay there until you get it. So they did. They didn't go back to Galilee, they didn't go back to their lives, they didn't go back to their jobs, they stayed in Jerusalem. They were seeking His will. They put theirs aside. You want to know what's interesting? Christ didn't tell them when. He says, you're going to receive power from on high. Just stay there. Now, after reading the New Testament, where you see that there's a verse that says, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. When Christ says, just wait, you don't know how long you're going to wait. But with patient obedience, they waited on God, and they continued. Patient obedience. 
we were kind of frustrated in this church. Oh man, we have this great opportunity. Oh, it's not going to work. We have this great opportunity. We've switched churches how many times in the last year? And there might be more. But we will not achieve anything on this earth without faithful, patient obedience. It really doesn't matter what we want. What matters is what God wants. And so we have to learn to be waiting upon Him. Be of good courage. Wait on the Lord. Wait, I say, on the Lord. They were great anticipation of receiving God's gift. That's what we should be. Patiently obedient. God desires to see and reward our faithfulness and our obedience. The other thing is that they were in one accord. Now, you think, okay, 10, 11 guys, they'd be fine. But there's a verse that complicates this. There were also the women and Mary. And somehow they all remained one accord. How did this happen? They all had different thoughts, I'm sure. They all had different feelings. But they put them aside. They put their selfish desires aside so they could be committed to the one goal. There is a common goal, which was to receive power from on high and then to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Why are we here? That's our goal. We're going to do this. We're going to be all in one mind. We're going to wait here and we're just going to go together. The harmony among them was like sweet music. Now, I want you to realize there will never be blessings where there are many agendas. God never blesses discord. He blesses unity. In St. Uh, Paul's epistles, epistle to the uh, Philippians, he says, be of one mind. And there's this great passage where he says, have the mind of Christ, but he says, be like-minded. If we're going to be an amazing church, a church of transformation, we need to understand the mission of the church. Everyone needs to be on board. So I'm going to mention the mission of this church over and over until we're all on one page. And if people come and say, we don't like this mission, and I'm going to welcome them to join another church that has the mission they want. But we want to all be on the same page in this church. The other thing that they did was prayer and supplication. And if you notice, it said they continued. For those 10 days, they continued in prayer and supplication. And what do you think that prayer looked like? A quiet time? A devotional? A routine, empty prayer spoken from the mouth but not from the heart? Or was that prayer full of faith? And trust in the one who promised. They were baptized by the Spirit. They were also baptized in prayer. And if you read the book of Acts carefully, they prayed all the time. It says, John and Peter went to the temple to pray the third hour. Sorry, ninth hour. When, when was Pentecost? It was the third hour. If you read when St. Peter, before he goes to see Cornelius, it was the sixth hour. And... They, Peter and Peter comes out of prison and he goes to the house because he says, I suspect them to be in prayer. And they were in prayer. Paul and Silas are in prison. They prayed in prison at midnight. At midnight they started praises. As if like there is this schedule of praying first, third, sixth, ninth, eleventh, twelfth hour. They're by the beach. They're by the rivers. They pray. It was not an occasion. Prayer was a way of life. If you look carefully at the mighty acts in the book of Acts, they're preceded by prayer. You know, here's an interesting thing. So in Acts, I believe it's chapter 8. St. Peter is in a city and there's a man who's paralyzed for 8 years. Most people that are paralyzed for 8 years are going to be paralyzed for the rest of their lives. So they ask Peter, can you come heal him? So he prays, he heals him. Then the next town, they heard about Peter being there. And there was a lady who was dead. Her name was Tabitha or Dorcas. 
They went and called Peter. Why would you call Peter? I mean, paralyzed, asking Peter to help, that's a big one. She's dead. What's he going to do? Peter comes. He sees they're all holding the clothes that this righteous, virtuous woman made. He sees them weeping. He says, okay, I just healed a man paralyzed for eight years. Let me in there. I'm going to go. What does he do? He says, everybody go out. I'm going to pray. He didn't say, you know, you know what? She's dead. It's a little bit late. He prayed with a prayer of faith, the kind of prayer that shook the building before, the kind of one that raises this woman. You want to know what's amazing? Cornelius. You know Cornelius? He's the Roman centurion. He wasn't even a Jew. He wasn't a believer. And the Holy Spirit wanted to come on him. If you read the book of, of uh, the story of Cornelius, it's amazing. He was a very generous person. He used to give alms to the poor. And it says he prayed continuously. Cornelius didn't even know the God he was praying to, but he prayed continuously. Isn't it amazing that God showed us that this non-believer prayed continuously and it said the Holy Spirit fell upon them when St. Peter, just like the apostles received. Because he did what? He prayed continuously. I want to tell you this. They continued in prayer. And if you read the very next part, the story of Pentecost, it says this. The story of Pentecost begins like this. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all with one accord in one place. So from when Christ told them, them not knowing when it was going to happen, they just happened to be in one accord in one place continuously praying. It wasn't a single prayer meeting. It was a way of life. And that's what's necessary. And that's what's going to be pushed here at this church. I know that we all have different desires for the church. We want a church that's accessible in English and has activities and we're close and this and that. I don't want to be a church, a part of a church, that that's all they have. I want to be a part of a church where everyone is growing in grace in the Spirit of God, where you are transformed in your spiritual life and the power of God is working in you because you are so in tune with Him because of our unity in spirit, the faith in God, and our in, in this church. Um, not only is it our one-year anniversary uh, coming up in a week, but also this season of the church is an amazing season. If you look at kind of from Lent to the Holy 50 Days to now, Lent was all about drawing close to God, reconciling with Him, understanding our weaknesses and our sins and embracing the salvation He gave for us. The Holy 50 Days might have been a struggle, but it was all about abiding with Christ and Him being among us for those 40 days before He ascended. So it was a time of repentance, reconciliation, abiding, and now is the time for serving. It's a time for continuing the work that He planned. The reason He came, it's to be carried out by, by us. His work isn't done because the goal is what? That not a single sinner should be lost, but that everyone should come to repentance. And when He told the disciples, He says, I'm going to leave, but I want you to go where? Go to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's how we're Christian, right? So this is a celebration of the ongoing responsibility of the church. If you were to look at the book of Acts, and I hope that you do, because it's a good book, it has 28 chapters. And the 28th chapter is the one book in the Bible where it doesn't have a real conclusion. It just kind of stops. The book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, as if like there was more to be written. As if there should have been like a 29th chapter. And I wonder if the churches today could be writing the 29th chapter of Acts, continuing the works of the Apostles. And I want to know, do you think we are a continuation of that church? I mean, we, we are in some ways, right? We have preserved 
the doctrines. The teachings that Christ gave to the apostles, there's a saying that says, Christ taught, the apostles preached, and the church preserved. We've preserved that completely. The worship, the liturgy, we receive, we've preserved that. But are there some things that we haven't preserved from that very early church in the way that they changed the world and turned it upside down? Now, the other theme I want to talk about, which we're gonna which is the theme of if I say what is the mission of Holy Transfiguration Church? One word, what is our theme? Transformation. Transformation. Our theme is transformation. The book of Acts, it's about transformation. And it's amazing that if there was no transformation in the lives of the church at that time, that the church would have never expanded. It has been from the beginning of Christianity. Transformation. If you look at the way they were transformed, the apostles themselves, you could tell that they were totally transformed in a way that we probably won't get to experience. For example, they got to speak in tongues. I mean, that's like totally different, right? Like all of a sudden you could speak in Chinese or, or Greek or whatever. I mean, that's amazing. But they were changed in their personalities and in their characteristics. They went from being fearful to the word bold. If you look up the word bold in the book of Acts, it happened, it's not like a random word, it's a theme. They became bold. Um, they, all of a sudden the church took a new form, like there was this new sense of hope. Right before, back in those days, resurrection was not believed by everyone. Then all of a sudden, now these apostles and everyone they're preaching, they're now preaching resurrection. It's a message of hope. All of a sudden, it transformed the way they lived on earth, right? So no longer their possessions were not just for them, but their possessions were for everyone. It transformed the meaning of suffering. Suffering was not just something that it was something that we went through on earth, but now all of a sudden, suffering had a new meaning. It was almost like a rite of passage. It was a way of living with Christ. For the sufferings of this world at that time were not be compared to the sufferings that would be revealed in us. Everything for them changed. The way they considered others. It was no longer if you were a Jewish person, you were my brother. Now who is my brother and sister? Jews, Greeks, barbarians, Scythians, slaves, women, men. There was, we all became one in Christ. And so transformation is the message of the gospel that you are transformed from sinners to children of God. We're transformed from citizens of earth to citizens of heaven. We're no longer members of a country. We're members of a kingdom. And that's our goal. It was the goal of God when He planned for the salvation of the world. And it has to be the continuing passion of the church transformation and that's what we're looking for we are to fulfill the unfinished works of God in the church God's desire believe it or not has not changed he hasn't just stopped desiring that not a single person should be lost and so this is going to be our focus believe it or not we're building a church but the church is not for us to have a safe haven for our kids to play with. It's supposed to be a center where transformation begins for our community and outside. It's not our house. Ultimately, it's God's house. And is there for God's worship and for God's purpose. And so we have to understand that is extremely important as we are building this church. Now, we're going to kind of go through the book of Acts, some of it, uh, in this series. Um, and one of our goals for 2015 was to read the whole New Testament in a year. If you haven't started yet, we're only five months and eight days into it. You haven't lost all. You can still do this. But I highly recommend reading the book of Acts during this fast. That's what we're all about in this fast. And so I always recommend it. But when we talk about Acts, it's not about talking about signs and wonders that happened 2,000 years ago. The goal is to see how God worked then and to see Him work in our church now. 
How did they get God to work in them then? And how can we get God to work in us the same way now? Now granted, it may not be the exact same. If you get the chance to speak in tongues, you may want to save it for home. As the Bible says, you may not want to do it unless someone can interpret. If you're able to raise people from the dead, please invite me. I think that would be awesome. It may not happen to everyone. God manifested Himself in wonders and miracles in the first church because it was necessary. Now He's working more in the hearts of people as opposed to just amazing wonders. So that's what we need to think about. Now I realize growing up in the Catholic Church, it hasn't really been a part of our mentality. I heard someone say this, and I think it's a great quote. He says, instead of becoming fishers of men, we've now become keepers of the aquarium. And in a way, it's kind of true that we're looking at making sure everyone in the church is fine, but Christ called people to be what? Fishers of men. And so eventually, we need to develop that mentality. Why did we celebrate Pentecost this last week? It was not merely just to remember an act that happened. I mean, we have these special prayers calling upon the Holy Spirit, not remembering what He did for them. It's not to remember the life of apostles. It's to live the life of an apostle. It's not to hear their works, but it's also to see and do their works. Christ said, you will do miracles greater than I. And the apostles did some pretty amazing things. And believe it or not, there are some people that are still living that mentality and God is working amazing things. I think nothing is more encouraging to you, to me, to anyone, is when you really can tangibly see the work of God in our lives. Now, that's a, an abnormal statement because God is working in our lives every single day, every single moment. He's not, He never stops working. But maybe to see it maybe more in a wonderful science kind of way might be nice. And again, we didn't celebrate Pentecost and then add a fast to this season just to help the local sushi markets. It's not just for merely obedience. But this is an important time of the church. St. John Chrysostom calls St. Pentecost the Feast of Feasts. It's the most important feast. And most of us don't even talk about the Holy Spirit very much. We talk about our Lord Jesus Christ, and we love to talk about His cross, and we love to talk about the resurrection, and sometimes we talk about the Father, but rarely do we ever talk about the Holy Spirit. And that's what this season is largely about. So... I think it's important that we think about sometimes doing what the apostles did. What made that church so successful? If you were to look up Acts 2 Church, do you know how many churches have decided to, they want the model of the original church to be their model? And so they look at Acts chapter 2, and they look at the things that they did in Acts chapter 2 and say, we're going to do that. Granted, they missed 1,600 years in between. Um, which the Acts 2 church should be our church. But I wonder, do we still have the type of out of the ordinary, world changing, irresistible lifestyle, mission, purpose, and faithful endurance that they had? I think oftentimes that gets lost. So, I'll be honest, I've done this series before at St. John Church three, four years ago. Um, and I kind of did it at another youth meeting uh, at the same time. And I'll be honest, I think it's a great series. It's entertaining, it's exciting, it's moving. I enjoyed giving it. I don't know if anyone enjoyed listening to it, but it's a great series. But you know what? It doesn't work. Unless you don't forget the most important part of the whole series, which we're going to get into today. Let's see. Let's look at what they did. And we'll really focus on how things happen in the book of Acts. So you take a group of people, 33 AD. They were how many people in that house? About 120. Within a day, they became 3,120. They added 3,000 souls in a day. 
Then they got to 5,000, not long after that. That's a 50-fold increase within short time. Now, if you look at from 33 to 64 AD, the martyrdom of St. Peter and St. Paul, those few people, few dozen people, similar to our number here, so same number, ordinary people, literally changed the world. Um, it changed the history of the world. Civilizations, politics, culture, medicine, education, and billions of lives. And they did it against horrible odds. I mean, they did it against uh, incredibly powerful opposition, the Roman Empire. And that was pretty, pretty tough to overcome the Roman Empire. It was a time of great immorality. At that time, child sacrifice was common. Prostitution oftentimes was a part of worship. Um, drunkenness, war, murder abounded everywhere. They had very little education to none, uh, very little to no money. Peter and John said, silver and gold, I have none. They had no earthly authority, no earthly weapons, no Facebook, and no internet. And they created something that now has over two billion members. I don't think Zuckerberg could have done what he did. Um, but like, I mean, they accomplished what he did with, with not the same technology. It's almost like us saying, okay, why don't we take us, let's go into a hostile country like Iraq, where there's this group of people called ISIS, and we'll say, oh, why don't we go in there, we're going to try and convert them. I say, well, that sounds pretty crazy. Like, are you sure that's what you're, you're risking your life, your livelihood, your comfort? That's crazy, absolutely crazy. And that's exactly what they were. They were crazy for God's purpose and crazy for God's will. And because of the transformation that happened in them, there was nothing in this world that could resist them. There was no way to stop them. There's no way to prevent them from doing what they were doing. They were discussing what the apostles were doing in Acts. And the uh, Sanhedrin and Pharisees are saying, what do we do with these two apostles, Peter and John? They keep preaching. And then someone said, listen, if this is from God, let's not fight against it. What could we do against God? Well, that's what this is. This is an initiative. It's God's initiative. And it changed the world. So what was their secret? How did they do it? Let's read from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 4 to 10. I know that Coptic people always bring their Bibles to every meeting at every Coptic church, right? Okay. I would love for us to do that, because that will be kind of like the Apostolic Church, where we're dedicated to the doctrine and the Word. Okay. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. So this is where after Christ rose, before he ascended, he was with them for 40 days. He says, do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But listen to this. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He says, I'm going to leave you. That's pretty bad news. He says, in John, it's better for me to leave you. He says, it's for your benefit that I leave. So I can send you the Holy Spirit. And this is power from on high. Now, I don't know how to put this in like a way that makes sense. But if you watch basketball, if I were to tell you, I am going to teach you and I'm going to give you my ability to shoot three pointers. You're like, okay, thanks, Mark. That's not exciting. But if I say, I'm going to teach you to shoot three-pointers, like Steph Curry shoots three-pointers, where it's like there's no limit anywhere on the court, from one foot, falling out of bounds, guarded by seven feet tall people, with no fear, he can do it, and you're like, okay. When Steph Curry says he's gonna teach you to shoot three-pointers, you're like, that's something. So when Christ says he's gonna give you power, like he's the all-powerful one saying, you're gonna have power from on high. That's an incredible statement.